I used to think that whoever told the most stories, took the most pictures before they died would win. It was a race to see who could capture the most images and tell the most stories in a lifetime. Every image that we take is a part of us and in some ways tells people about who we are. Uh, but what is an image and what are we trying to do with our films and our photography? We are showing the world where we were looking and what we were doing. We are documenting our point of view. If you put together all the images you've ever created in your lifetime and you piece them all together, in some ways, if someone looked at them, they could see the story of your life by just looking at the images. So if a picture is an experience, if it is a moment captured in time, in some ways, it also represents who we were when we took that picture. The images that we create define us. They are our stories, they are our friends, they are our family. And that's where most of us start. We start by taking pictures of our family. Here's a picture of uh, one of the pictures of my sister, one of the hundreds of pictures of my sister. This one is called Red Circles Rosa. And we start by taking pictures of our family because they're the most important part of our life. So we learn from them, they're with us every day, we make our mistakes with them. They're also the stars of our first films the reluctant stars of our first films, and they are the first people that we photograph because they're our stories. We also and sometimes cover people's laces with clay. That's still my sister. I have binders and binders of photographs of my friends and family. What happens is most filmmakers and photographers become the documentarians of their family. We usually are very reluctant to take on that task at first, but I've learned to embrace it and to make it part of who I am. This one here is of my father, and he used to do shift work and he would work two weeks night and two weeks day for 30 years. Um, so he was always sort of awake and sort of asleep because of the nature of his work and in some ways this was my representation of that shifting from awake and asleep that always occurred. Um, the next image is a picture of my grandfather. Taken in a small house in the uh, southern part of Italy where my mother grew up in, it was on an olive plantation. My grandfather's standing in the doorway, there's a key hanging in, in the keyhole, there's a piece of a chair in the edge and in the corner. For me, this picture is my grandfather. It represents who he was. So what eventually happened is I came back and I had all these pictures from Italy and then eight years later I went back uh, to see my grandparents again, but my, my grandfather had passed away. So what I did was I set up the same type of image but with my grandmother. And the idea behind it was I wanted a picture that could be hung together. So when you hang these two pictures together, it's as if my grandmother is looking at my grandfather. And these images were taken years apart. And for me, this tells the story of my grandparents. My grandfather's at work in the fields, and my grandmother's at work at home waiting for him to get back. This is what I consider to be the iconic image of my grandparents. For several years, I would photograph shadows and reflections. You all develop a style, and what happens eventually is you recognize that you have a style, but it can take a lot of years to notice that. And what your style can help you realize is something about yourself. So for me, I was very shy at the time. So basically, I would be afraid of facing the subject. So instead of taking a picture of the subject, I would take a picture of the shadow or the reflection of a subject. And the problem with having a style is that eventually you have to move beyond it. You have to find a way to realize that that's what you were interested in for a while, but you need to start finding a way to produce images that say something new and different. And in my case, I'm happy to report that I've moved beyond most reflections and most shadows, but they still appear in some of my work. And uh, not only do you need to move beyond your uh, stylistic choices, but you need to move beyond your compositional choices as well. And when it comes to composition, it's a very, very difficult thing to explain. And people ask me about composition all the time. And I usually have the same story to tell. It's a story about how I was brainwashed by Triangles, squares, and circles. These shapes are sort of part of everything that surrounds us. And if you find a way to analyze the world around you, you can sort of find pieces of each of these shapes in anything that you're looking at. The assignment that I had was called the nine square assignment. What we had to do was make nine three inch by three inch squares and take a part of a square, a part of a circle, and a part of a triangle and put them in these three by three inch squares. Sounds ridiculous, I know, but we had to do this for a full semester, a full year of triangles, squares, and circles. And what you ended up doing eventually is you took the negative and positive shapes created by those other squares and you cut them out. And then you moved them around and you painted them and then you moved them somewhere else. And then one day you would paint the negative shape black and the other day you would draw lines in the, 
in the reverse shape. So basically it was a year of constantly cutting and pasting. It was in some ways being like you were back in kindergarten. And a lot of people didn't take it seriously, but I tried to work my way through it. And then I put the, put the sketchbook away and I didn't think of it again. And then during that summer, in between the first and second semester of the photo program, I went to the southern part of Italy. I took those pictures of my grandfather that you saw. And what I discovered when I got back years later and I looked at the images um, that I took during that summer, if I looked at the sketches that I had been making for a whole semester at school, and then I looked at the negative shapes that I cut out and copied and pasted for so long, they ended up in all the pictures that I took over the last couple years after that course. So in a lot of ways, I was brainwashed by geometry. Now composition is, is one of the things I don't think that you can be taught. You have to teach this yourself. You have to be willing to cut and paste triangles and squares for a long time or pay attention to paintings or look at the world in a different way. So there really isn't a way for me to sort of just sit you down and teach you composition. It is something that is gained by experience and by the willingness to try to get it, better at it. Um, so when it comes to telling stories with images, eventually you have to use your composition to tell a story. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure that your images are somehow combined in a similar theme or there's a structure to them that is the same. And when you can have a similar theme, then you can use your pictures to actually tell a story. One of the first series of images that I did was called Bypassing Light. It told a very simple story. It's, it, the story was very simple. Hello, my name is Marco and I'm afraid of color. Color is so powerful and can do so many things that I was always afraid of what it, what it could end up doing to my image. Something I didn't mean to happen could happen. So with this series of images, what I did was limit my color palette. I was only allowed to shoot two or three colors. In some cases, some of these images look very black and white because there is no color. These pictures were also bleach bypassed. So what happened was the blacks became more muted and the colors became blocked up, which means that the colors even became more powerful. And I'm still afraid of color. I still have a little bit of nightmares sometimes about it, but this process of looking for color led to the theme that I was going for. Another theme to these images was a simple one, a very childlike one. Why aren't you looking here? And that was a theme of a lot of my images for a long time, a very childlike view of the world where, from my eyes, there is beauty in every corner and every alley of every city. You just have to take the time to find it. You have to look at things in that different way. And it's not just with a different lens, it's with a different way of thinking. Uh, and eventually I moved away from this fear of color and I wanted to do sort of capture motion. And I ended up starting a series called Form in Motion, which was a, a series of images on dance. Um, the other thing I wanted to do was to create an audience of other artists. So I wanted to learn about dance and what could be done with dance at the same time that I was creating images. With these images, what I was doing was actually moving with the dancer. So if you can imagine the situation, the dancer's here moving around, and I'm actually moving with them as I take the picture. Uh, to use a film term, I was dollying with them. So I would actually move forward as they were dancing, creating these images that were blurred, and they looked like streaks of color. Um, so again, hopefully, doing what I intended to do, to capture motion. Another part of this series was something that was a little different. It's about art out of context. Um, so basically, there's images that we had of a dancer on a bus, a dancer in the office, and then dancers in a, a grocery store. With this image here, if you look at it for a few more seconds, you can see that the image is now becoming a metaphor. And the first time that someone looks at this image, the goal is for someone to automatically think, why is a dancer on the bus? What we're doing is we're taking an art that is usually performed on a stage and taking it out of context so someone will spend a few more seconds looking at the image. And when you start trying to move away from the simple childlike view of, oh, look at this, and you start trying to say something with your images, then things take a little bit more planning. 